each of the aircraft took its own niche in the sky. The light TX were more suitable for battles at low and middle altitude. The heavy lags with their powerful weapons were better at destroying bombers and ground targets, while the MiGs were meant to fight at high altitude. With the uncertainty of the nature of the future war, such mutual support of the aircraft combat features meant a lot. It allowed to escape possible mistakes and to obtain a deeper use of the fighter aviation. Now only time was needed to complete the rearmament process. Year 1941, the June issue of the Deutsche Wochenschau. The German documentary film shows the first day of war on the Eastern Front. Heinkel 111 Luftwaffe bombers are in the sky. They fly deep into the Soviet territory. In those tragic days, the Soviet aviation suffered enormous losses. A lot of aircraft did not manage to even take off. In the very first day of the war, the Soviet Air Force lost around 1,200 combat aircraft. In the Western military districts, the better part of fuel depots and armed storages were destroyed and troops management was disintegrated. The surviving fighters were undertaking sporadic attempts to cover their striking aircraft and intercept the enemy bombers. They had to carry out tasks not typical for the fighters attacking German ground troops, which masses were in the offense along each and every road. Right before the intrusion, Germany and its allies concentrated at the USSR border almost 5,000 combat aircraft, of which almost one-third were fighters. The Soviet Air Force had a significant numerical superiority. In five border military districts, there were almost 11,000 aircraft, of which around 5,000 were fighters. However, the majority of them were outdated. In spite of numerical superiority and intensive propaganda planting the idea of the Red Army's invincibility, officers and commanders feared to express any initiative in result of the wave of repressions that overwhelmed the country before the war. Besides, most of the Soviet pilots were poorly trained. Right before the war, the combat aircraft flight experience of an Air Force school cadet was reduced to only 15 hours, while a German cadet had no less than 80 flight hours. Air shooting and aerobatics were excluded from the Soviet cadet training program in order to reduce accidents. All this showed itself in the first months of the war. For instance, attacking a bomber, Soviet pilots would open fire at a distance and from an inconvenient angle. Absence of radio on most of the Soviet aircraft aggravated the hard situation even more. Luftwaffe completely dominated in the air. In some cases, the most experienced Russian pilots achieved success on the outdated E-16s. But in most of the cases, fighters were passive, deviating from direct confrontations with the enemy. E-16, with its weak armament and insufficient power-to-weight ratio, could hardly compete with Messerschmitt. Therefore, pilots had to conduct air battles at high speed using the E-16 better horizontal maneuverability. Sometimes a roundabout was used when aircraft were making a circle protecting one another. The Soviet aviation badly needed the fighters capable of countering the German Messerschmitt. However, production in the west of the country was urgently dismantled. The enemy was advancing at all fronts. The aircraft factories grant evacuation to the Urals and Siberia started. Fighters' production in new places developed in extremely hard conditions. Their production surpassed the pre-war level only by spring 1942. 
Problems with the product's quality remain since mainly women and teenagers having no sufficient qualification worked at the factories. They worked and learned to work. Production rate increased every day and soon replenishment of the Air Force became tangible. Motherland. We solemnly swear to use all our strength, our blood, and our lives in fighting the enemy. One month after the start of the war, Luftwaffe aircraft performed the first air raid on Moscow. Almost 250 bombers were involved in it. However, the Moscow air defense was so powerful and well organized that the November German raids were practically stopped. The new Soviet fighters played an important role in this confrontation. This documentary film shows the Yak-1 squad performing a combat duty at Kubinka airfield near Moscow. This type of aircraft took part in combat actions from the first and through the last days of the war. Of all fighters of the new generation, Yak-1 was the most light and maneuverable. Pilots valued it since it excused even very rough piloting mistakes. Among Yak's deficiencies was the one-piece wing, which complicated aircraft's operation, transportation and repair. The fighter had a good armament of two rapid-firing Schkass machine guns and a 20mm Schwach cannon. A later Yak-1B modification had better view, additional armor, and more intense armament. The first series of this aircraft were equipped with five machine guns. The central was soon replaced with a cannon. Up to eight rockets or two bombs could be mounted beneath the wing. This fighter was most successfully used against bombers and at delivering ground attacks. Pilots appreciated the log's high vitality helping them survive in combat. And still the aircraft was rather heavy in piloting and not enough maneuverable. 